audio jungle. A lot of people in general that like are, are love working in crypto, you know, like not just uh, because it's an interesting topic, but also because it's like almost kind of an interesting lifestyle. Edcon definitely does do a good job of capturing that spirit. I always like Edcon. I think that these um, these community oriented, community organized conferences tend to have a little bit more technical chops than the more sort of centralized, organized um, conferences, which tend to be a bit more glitzy and glamorous. So it really is important that uh, not only do we have this online forum, but we also like communicate in person because there's a lot of information that doesn't necessarily get across when you're you know, just using text. I mean, things that I like about Ethereum culture in general is like not taking ourselves seriously, but at the same time accomplishing real impact. Whether that's you know, like unicorns or rainbows or, or or badger dances, definitely something unique and special that you know like you don't see any, anywhere else. Like normally, it's either boring and serious or ridiculous. And like I feel like the Ethereum community tries uh, hard to find a happy medium. What the Ethereum community has done really well is it it really welcomes newcomers um, in a in a much better way than other communities I've noticed at least in the blockchain space. And so if you're a newcomer, you're not like shoved at the door or like people are actually like very welcoming into the space. And that's what I love about being connected to the Ethereum community. And when you come to conferences like this, you bump into developers who are working on really interesting stuff. And then that's how you stay abreast on the ecosystem. They think when you have a really true grassroots open source movement like Ethereum with that ethos, you're gonna really see this future of money not only have business implications, but a lot of societal implications, um, and ones that can really help change the world. If yesterday was more based around the protocol level, we're gonna kind of move up the stack a little bit today, talking more on the kind of application side, talking about the business side. I see a, a full crowd in here, and I won't uh, hold us too much longer. We have our last speaker before lunch, uh, the creator of Ethereum, Vitalik Buterin. Okay, cool. Um, so um, today I am going to start talk. About, uh, I'm going to talk about what will hopefully be one of the more joyous experiences in Ethereum in uh, one in, in a fairly short time, which is uh, being a Casper validator. One of the goals that I'm really trying to accomplish with um, the the design proposals for Casper and sharding is to make it so that. The Ethereum protocol has no inherent built-in security assumptions other than information theory and hash algorithms. And so having any single specific built-in signature algorithm would kind of go against that goal, right? So the idea here is instead of specifying your public key, you literally specify a piece of code which will then be used to verify any signatures that you sign. Um, you will also um, soon be able to stake in the uh, soon with a trademark, so that's you know two more than two weeks. Uh, you'll be able to stake in the experimental sharding system, and the in the experimental sharding system, deposit minimums are likely to be much lower, so you'll also be able to stake there. Great, and thank you, and uh, wish you all a happy, joyful validating experience. So we're working on the Cosmos network and one of the defining features of, of Cosmos is the idea of interoperability, right? And right now we have a lot of independent kind of self-sovereign blockchains that don't really connect or communicate with one another. And it's a problem for a number of reasons. One reason is that if you have, say, Bitcoins and you're doing stuff on Bitcoin and then you want to move over to Ethereum to do things that you can only do on Ethereum, the only way really to currently do that um, is to traverse through a, a centralized exchange, and and the process, is, you know, it's a little bit, it's a little bit disconcerting that you have to do this, and you have to actually go through this exchange. There might actually be tax consequences when all you're trying to do is access new functionality. What what we're proposing is that we enable. Uh, tokens to flow a little bit more naturally from one blockchain to another. Problem, distributed state. This is, this is what I spent all my time thinking about. And this isn't some ad hoc esoteric problem that is only of concern to computer scientists or to blockchain geeks or people in this room. Um, this, is, this is the fundamental problem in complex organized systems. This is the thing that is responsible for our ability to understand each other, to self-organize, to agree on a time and a place to meet, to see a conference on the history of distributed state on a Friday morning, right? If it weren't for the fact that we shared 
that there was a, a state machine replicated across all of us that allowed us to understand the English language, it wouldn't be possible to communicate, right? So distributed state is really the, the, the fundamental basic problem to human social organization, to biological organization, to the, the very essence and being of an organism. And of course, today, to distributed systems, to, to digital distributed systems, right? We are basically saying that a single maximalist, like one chain to rule them all, uh, and one chain that can basically do everything, uh, doesn't really work, it doesn't scale, um, it's not that efficient. What we really want is an ecosystem of many blockchains uh, that are usually specialized blockchains that can all work together uh, to accomplish uh, the needs of the entire ecosystem. I think Cosmos can have a huge impact also in helping out building scalable applications. Uh, I think the Cosmos bet is kind of, yeah, there will be many different blockchains uh, for specific purposes. And I can also totally see that there's one blockchain for oracles, there's one blockchain for prediction markets. Over 30% of the population owns cryptocurrency and this is mainly because uh, it's really easy to trade and buy cryptocurrency yeah? so it's integrated into their mobile applications you can easily do it uh, and this has contributed hugely to the success uh, of cryptocurrencies uh, in Asia if we want to make them users of our ecosystem we have to build decentralized exchanges which are actually really competitive to what is already existing what Cosmos is doing which is bringing like um actual Byzantine fault tolerant consensus algorithms, uh, which have become like a buzzword in the space, but other than ours, there's actually no other mature engineering system that employs this uh, approach to consensus. Bringing that to the world is uh, an, uh, an incredibly important thing. Cosmos. Um, so we uh, we had a fundraiser you know, last year, and uh, last at Con, we also talked about it a little bit, but uh, I want to give a little recap of what it's about. Tendermint is a partial solution to the proof of work, proof of stake problem. Um, it's a component of our proof of stake solution. Um, so while it is a consensus algorithm, it, it by itself is not a blockchain. It doesn't really know what to do with messages or transactions. All it does is it knows how to order them. Cosmos is a network of blockchains. So maybe we can think of Tendermint as an operating system like Windows or Linux, and Cosmos is like the World Wide Web of computers that are running on various operating systems. So what Cosmos does is uh, it communicates with all the other blockchains using IBC. It's kind of like IPC, but it's inter-blockchain communication. To prove that the last block hash on Tendermint was some hash, all you need is that hash along with two-thirds or more of signatures from the validator set. Uh, and in general, you know, uh, you want all the validators to sign, but uh, uh, it, you don't need all the signatures because it's Byzantine fault tolerant. You only need 67% of the voting power. And that proof, which is the signatures and the hash, proves to the other blockchain that something really happened on that other blockchain. And from that proof, that hash, you can later asynchronously provide a Merkle proof down to anything in the persistence layer of the blockchain. Interoperability between blockchains is a really interesting both problem and design space. So there needs to be much better infrastructure for interoperating between blockchains for sure. And it turns out that Plasma is actually part of that interoperability story. So essentially what, what Plasma allows you to do is it allows you to create these you know, side chains, but you, create, you, you make it so that the trust that you actually have to you know, provide is, is rooted in the root chains. So just to uh, attempt to describe Plasma, um, the, the, uh, a distinguishing feature between kind of plasma or general state channels is that plasma, you're, you're, uh, uh, you have this kind of like exit mechanism and, and this is also different from sharding and so you have, uh, uh, it's, it's not an N of N multi-sig, it is uh, open participation, you can learn things about the, the chain, it's off-chain. And then Plasma is this technology that allows this additional secret ingredient, which is basically you can take a huge pile of data, hash it, and then publish the root of the, the, the workable root of that, of that data on chain. And if you, you can use that secret extra ingredient as a construction in clever ways in order to get much better uh, capital efficiency and like much better like user inclusion and, like, and substitution properties. Can I, can I dumb that down like 10 levels? Uh, which is that like, 
You have the main chain and a plasma chain. The plasma chain puts Merkle roots on the main chain, and the users have the guarantee that as long as they're online and watching the plasma chain, as soon as something goes wrong on the plasma chain, they can go back to the main chain and are guaranteed to be able to withdraw their coins using Merkle proofs of what has previously been posted. It's an online community, so I interface with a lot of people on forums, on Reddit, on Twitter, and we discuss all these ideas about what we want to build. And a lot of times it's just a string of texts that I'm communicating with. And when I come to EdCon, I get to actually meet, them, uh, meet those people in person and to make the kind of human-to-human -human connection uh, in a real way, I think really supplements like the online nature of the community really well. So I would hope if I had a crystal ball that in five years we'll be at a point where we're impacting normal people's lives. So I would like people to actually be transacting on a blockchain every day. And I'm not sure whether that's gonna be because, because of a payments use case or because of a gaming use case, but whatever it is, I really hope that in five years I can come to the conference and know that our work is impacting a lot of people outside the space. So we're gonna have 10 people on stage representing each team. Then you guys have literally like 10 to 15 seconds per person to kind of pitch us again of why we should give you these tokens or these votes. At EdCon is, People are here to build amazing stuff. Uh, there's no really like ethos of like my way or the highway. Everyone's experimenting. Everyone's trying new things. So I like the whole, I like the whole right. culture of Ethereum. Where it's like let's build some really cool stuff. Thank you guys so much. This means a lot for us. And I just want to personally thank all the other super demo, the teams and startups. You guys are doing such amazing, amazing things for the ecosystem. Keep it up, keep going. My takeaway from EdCon is that even though the Ethereum community has grown substantially over the last few years, we're still having kind of a carefree atmosphere about ourselves, not taking ourselves too seriously, and having a good time. I really like this community. I think that it's a very unique community, and uh, seeing everybody, you know, know each other, give hugs, just walk around and really support each other is something that's very inspiring, even as we grow. I, I believe in this technology and I, what affects me is I, I believe that the minimum amount of opportunity infrastructure, public infrastructure ne needs to exist so that everyone has the power to kind of learn to go after what they're passionate about. And I think this technology really aligns well with that. And, and I, it's, it's been an amazing experience to meet all of you and to talk about these issues across um, te technology, economics, and philosophy and all that. So it's been, it's been amazing. Thank you. And to see people that already have an advantage in a given space thinking about what's next for the entire, entire ecosystem and leading the charge was really exciting, and to talk to him face-to-face -face about that was an amazing opportunity at EdCon. You know, just the, the amount of energy and activity and the quality of that energy and activity, I think, is really encouraging. 